music, artwork, and uh, jumping in video games. This to me is the Triforce of things that we will forever refine but never perfect. The reason being that these three have qualities that give them value in respect to their context. The right piece should fit the right environment, complement the ideas that you want to explore and express, meaning that there is no universally perfect piece. You wouldn't rock up to a preschool and pull out Hereditary, well I mean I would, but if you wanted to entertain them you'd put something on that's more akin to their baby tastes. Here the right film has to fit the right audience, and jumping in both traditional games and fighting games also shares this conundrum. The act of going up and down might not seem like a complicated task to do well, however the way that someone goes up and down and what they're permitted to do during it changes a game more than climate change is changing the planet. Even platformers that are designed primarily around jumping will have different types of jumps to change that ever so important game feel. Mario and Mega Man have two very different jumps. While Mega Man turns on a dime, Mario's unusual dump truck mother's basement dwelling body type means that he retains quite a lot of momentum and has to slow down and speed up. Both of these jumps are designed as solutions to problems, and so tasks are built around these types of jumps. Mario's problems are designed around positioning and movement, with a de-emphasis around combat and thus a greater focus on movement itself. Are you able to make this jump? How are you going to build up the speed to make this jump and also avoid this enemy at the same time? You know, problems designed around the environment that aren't climate change. Mega Man, on the other hand, has problems designed around its combat, and the environment works in tandem with shooting lemons. Since the jump is so freeform and simple, it's pretty unengaging to put Mega Man inside of Mario's style of level design since his basic white girl movement doesn't complement pure platforming. So instead, the challenges are created around more precise combat scenarios, where the style of simple yet flexible jump shines through as a positive. Many platformers create jumps and then design problems around it, because many single player games often put priority on game feel and create interesting scenarios around the character's strengths and limitations. However, these jumps in particular were designed around the idea of being flexible, creating a tool to exclusively solve problems and creating a sense of player freedom rather than restriction. But what about a game like Castlevania? Although its jump is a solution to problems, relative to its contemporaries it's like trying to jump with you, your controller, and your character covered in Nickelodeon slime since there's no flexibility once you've made a decision. You can still attack, but once you've chosen the direction that you're going in you might as well have proposed to your landing spot. Castlevania doesn't have a jump that's made for its game feel, but instead falls a bit more in the category of jumps I'm really fucking eager to talk about. The jump in the original Castlevania has a dual purpose design. It's not only a solution to your problems, but in itself a problem to solve. Yeah, it might get you over a projectile, but you need to make sure that you've got enough distance to ensure that you're not going to land onto your enemy or completely overshoot a jump. You need to ensure that you're going to go up and down and still avoid what you're planning to go over without putting yourself in danger. And so, problems are designed around it. Challenges are built within this distance where you have to carefully consider what you're about to do and whether it's a good idea, and if you play mindlessly like the other two, you're going to put yourself in positions you can't work out of. Yeah, it's not as complex as getting like a, I don't fucking know, like a doctor in physics, but it demands more from you as a player. And you don't have to enjoy it. After all, it's designed to feel confining and restrictive, whereas most games are made to provide us with a sense of power and thus escapism, as it allows us to feel like we have some kind of control over our short and fleeting lives. But the design of a jump like this is intentional and adds its own unique flavour to a game. It's a new type of challenge, however, the environment that it resides in is still one of a player versus a pre-designed puzzle. It's you versus Shigeru Miyamoto, or Hitoshi Akamatsu, I don't know, another Japanese name. But what happens when you take them out of this player versus designer environment and put them into a player versus player environment? The answer is, well there's a lot of different types of jumps, and so the answer varies depending on what each developer intended and how they wanted their jumps to be used. Used. The key difference that they'll all share is that they're forced to take on this dual design. Regardless of the type of jump that they employ, they'll all become problems since there's someone waiting on your landing to swat you out of the sky. However, even with this forced design shift, it's still a required mechanic for many games, and the way that jumping, jump arcs, and more importantly general use of vertical space works provides different games, specifically fighting games, with their own unique identity. As a disclaimer, we're going to be omitting certain details and simplifying things in regards to specific games, so don't shit your pants if I don't mention the larger implications of your specific game. Even the simplest jumps affect design, like how Street Fighter 2 is very much focused on its design around controlling ground space because they created a very limited vertical environment. Jumps follow a slow and simple arc that's easy to respond to, and so a lot of emphasis is placed on controlling the ground prior to them being in jumping distance, and then once they are, pushing them out of the sky once they are there. The design here, from the perspective of the person jumping, is that it should be a way to avoid danger and potentially get more damage on your opponent, with the danger of having to commit and potentially get anti-ed for it. From 
from the perspective of the person that's being jumped in on, the risk is that someone might jump over your next attack and punish you on the way in. However, since they can't defend themselves at that point, you're guaranteed reward if you use your impeccable foresight, aka reacting within like 30 frames. The situation here is very clear for both players, which for some people is dull as fuck. But let's not dismiss a simple jump. After all, some people might find this jump engaging by itself and like it's easy to understand quality. Perhaps some of these players would like another game that has different kinds of jumps whilst retaining some of its simple qualities. So how could we create a bit more of a spicy jump without complicating the scenario too much? One simple way would be by adding a defensive choice after you've decided the jump. As I'm sure you're aware, Street Fighter Third Strike did this with parries. To simplify the explanation, let's also ignore the fact that there's variations on jumps a little bit because, I mean, we've got a better example of that coming. Calm down. In Third Strike, there's parries, which I'm sure we're all aware of because, you know, this video exists, but for the uninitiated, prepare for a university diploma in parries. You press forward and fuck all happens. Mild oversimplification, but being able to negate incoming damage with a precise input wildly changes how you engage with the airspace. It still keeps all the other stuff from the previous example, you know, it's a committal choice, positional danger, you anti-air that shit, yada yada. However, now there's a defensive layer to that anti-air situation, which in turn changes some of the other points as well. Now if you're jumping in and you know your opponent has been ready to invade your space like an American police officer, you can parry that shit on the way in and now you've got frame advantage and you make your approach safe. From the perspective of the anti-airer, if you know that your opponent is looking to parry a hit, you can do a multi-hitting anti-air and punish him for trying to make it safe, or, you know, just change when you do the anti-air. That said, if you know your opponent is looking for a parry, you know that you can't be pushing a button in order to parry, so you can just walk around and do whatever you want. Set up a jump of your own, catch him with a low on the way in, get more subscribers than Brian F, anything's possible. But now if you know that your opponent thinks you're fishing for parries and they won't be anti-airing because they're playing against your parry, you can go one step back in your game plan and just smack that motherfucker. You can also start baiting people in with this, because even though the jump arc is quite Still, we as people have something that doctors refer to as small brain. So if we see a jump in and it's just outside of the range of their attack and our actual anti-air, we'll still go for it sometimes because, well, small brain. In doing so, we can start to set up whiff punishes and create game plans around how we're flawed as people. This is definitely still possible in Street Fighter 2, but in a game where there's more variables to any given scenario, we're less likely to be able to keep all within the mental stack and so we're more prone to error, and so these kinds of situations can be relied upon more. To help Third Strike's air conundrum, the additional parry is very precise, and so it isn't so simple to execute that it feels like one option covers a very large majority of options, the way that something like an air block might. Which wouldn't be a problem per se, in that it would provide new and different challenges to overcome, but it wouldn't be very engaging to play alongside. Case in point being that many games that do provide air blocking generally only allow it when the other opponent is in the air or it's a projectile, but we'll we'll talk about that later. Let's say you don't like parries, however. It's not that you're going, I have to press forward when? How do I do this? This is too hard. It's just that you find that it changes the way that you interact with verticality in ways that you don't really want to play with. Instead you want a different type of air game, but one where the jump arcs change to allow for more positional choices and change combat through movement. Well let me introduce you to the King of Fighters. This one specifically, O2UM. This was the one that has rollbacks, so this is the one I'm promoting. Even if it does infuriate me to no end. Why does the character select work like this? It's so- ah! KOF shares a very similar jump to Street Fighter 2 in that you've got very limited choices and can't really defend yourself once you've committed to a jump. The difference being that Street Fighter's jumps look like this, but KOF's look like it's doing some over the rainbow shit, aka you've got a lot of choices. You've got standard jumping, hyper jump, short hops, hyper hopping, backwards long jumps, there's a lot of choices here, and even though the actions you're permitted to do during each jump is the same, the purpose of each jump is different. Now you've got these little hops that allow you to quickly access an overhead, and whilst you have to commit to the position you're about to take, you don't have to live with the expectation that you're forever going to be a failure because you're going to get anti ed every time. Reason being is that these hops are so fast that it's often difficult to respond, and so whilst you need to commit to the space that you're about to take, it's often unreasonable for your opponents when he air you every single time. You're also pretty evasive during this hop, because even though you're not going to be hopping to the International Space Station back, you go over every single low poke and most mids, and so you're not in the air long enough for people to effectively anti-air you with any kind of consistency. That said, if you're doing this, then yeah, expect to get your ass clapped every once in a while. Now, if you only had this one kind of hop, this wouldn't be as interesting. It would still be cool in that now you have fast access to an overhead, which makes for an even more dangerous offense and place more difficulty on the part of the defender, but there's more to an interesting jump than just how fast you can access an overhead. To add more to the awkward fighting game Jenga that we're playing, they added hyper hopping, which makes it easier to turn a simple situation into something that's more akin to, oh fuck, what the hell is happening, hell? This is also possible in normal jumps, but by allowing 
allowing the player to have different distances that they can jump around with, it creates more player freedom and expands the ability to deceive expectations of the opponent. However, there's more changes that come along with the jumping aside from the jump itself. If you want to do a jumping combo with a short hop, it requires a more specific timing because you're not going to impact your opponent and land quickly after, meaning you have to press as low to the ground as you can and not just as soon as you're in your opponent's proximity. But more importantly, anti-airs changed. In Street Fighter, a lot of anti-airs cover this space ever so slightly to the side of you and above you to make it so that their main purpose is swatting people out of the air. In KOF, a good anti-air would have needed to change to be more diagonally focused with fast recovery to cover multiple angles and timings. But guess what they didn't? Here's how this is a thing! Is the sequelitis influence getting a bit too direct? Generally speaking, most moves specifically designed to be anti-airs outside of DPs still cover this directly above airspace. There are exceptions to this rule, but they're rarer than a good modern panic at the disco song. This combined with a much faster jump arc that's lower makes for many more situations where you're better off making choices that cover the space before they really get into the air or meeting them in the air, rather than an option that covers the problem from the ground with such commitment. It's often better to choose an option that meets them in the air because it reduces the risk as a defender since you'll get knocked down instead of comboed, however if you make the right decision you end up turning the tables and putting their own advantage against them. If you're not going to choose an option that's as direct as an air to air, it's better to choose a move that's fast and high with low recovery, like a jab, because it often covers the space required, but is less committal than most options designed to be more traditional anti-airs. These types of jump don't change anything on the micro level of design, after all you still jump in, you still have some commitment, wonder where your life went wrong, you know how it goes. But now jumps are a solution to problems and problems themselves, and also act as tools of expression through movement as well as a collection of tools to create a more complex neutral. Whereas jumps previously overcame specific problems, this kind of jump creates a wide variety of outcomes from the same type of solution. And so once you've learned how to handle all of these jumps with proficiency, you can start to tailor them solutions to what you're comfortable with. You're not going to express yourself like you're doing a follow along with Bob Ross, but in terms of a competitive setting, it's free enough that the variable choices allow you to create a unique playstyle. The design began to shift away from covering this horizontal space until they're at a closer distance and then covering the air and the ground at the same time, and became a game of movement and the mid-range, because hops and jumps combined created a game that was much faster and easier to overcome small obstacles in. This made for a game that for many felt much more dynamic, even if it was much harder to get a grip on because it changed so much of the smaller mechanics. Although I still prefer 3S, KOF just makes me very angry. As a side note, there's a fantastic set of videos by Dandy J called The Beginner's Incomplete Guide to KOF. If I've just sparked your interest, I'd recommend watching them videos to help you get into KOF without fumbling around for as long as I did. This doesn't necessarily make for a fighter that everyone can enjoy, but starts to make fighting games unique not only for combos and characters, but neutral and choices. Jumping is still a problem and a solution, but allows you to do the same thing with multiple different types of solution. This helps to add expression to the air game, which in turn becomes player freedom over time. And with the expansion of airspace in minor ways that led to big changes in game feel, came the edge to make large changes to the airspace to fill in gaps in the market that weren't satisfied. And whilst there's many games that have smaller character specific instances of movement, I'm talking stuff that's universal like air dashing and double jumps. We'll get to you later, be patient honey. Regardless of what type of mobility you add to an airspace, if it's another positional choice after a jump, you're going to be adding, potentially removing, and changing ideas in that space that you're playing in. The idea that changes almost universally is a shift in commitment. This change generally tends to be made in an effort to shift jumping away from the restrictive commitment focused jumps of Castlevania and push it towards the feeling of player freedom of most platformers. Think about any game with a double jump in it. If someone's jumping in on you but they haven't used their second jump or any other type of movement option for that matter, there's probably going to be a bit of hesitation around trying to clap them out of the sky. Reason being is that without the second jump gone, you can't guarantee that you're not getting baited and you're about to go from burying your fist in someone to being fisted. The commitment that's present in the previous examples isn't present here to the same degree, since now you've got choices, even if limited, that can remove you from a dangerous situation and turn a negative IQ jump in into a situation that your two brain cells won't stop rattling on about. However, once you recognise that you've burned someone's double jump, you feel like you've just set a trap for them since they've removed their defensive choices and that commitment is reinstated, generally with even less safety since you're in the air set to a position with an even longer duration of time allowing your opponent to follow up with more consistency. To help you feel the sense of power as the person being jumped in on, the games that employ less commitment on jumps often have tools that allow you to reposition yourself quickly from the ground in order to catch up with someone who's darting around in the sky. Platform fighters generally make it so that moving around on the ground is faster than moving in the air, and so remaining grounded where you can move quickly with less commitment is still an advantage even within this expanded airspace. Rivals is the only good platform fighter by the way. Games like Marvel have dashes that are fast and cover a large portion of the screen, many of which can be cancelled into something that allows you to either immediately dash again or can be cancelled into a jump, giving you extra aerial momentum. This assists in shifting the power of balance to be more even rather than pushed in the favour of the person jumping by allowing you to Usain Bolt right up to someone that's in the air. The part that I think is more interesting is that often developers won't stop at double jumping, but also proceed to 
blow the movement door wide open with air dashing. Different types of games have different types of air dashing, and because I don't want to be here forever, I'm going to have to generalize a bit here. I don't want to hear the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle community come at me. Different air dashes for different folks, as Bob Ross said. Is this an air dash? I, I don't think I would consider it one. Now you've got many choices in the air, and turns a scenario that's like putting the right shape into the right hole into defuse the bomb or I murder your firstborn. Now the rigid decisions of the previous jumping examples expand, not from the different types of jumps that are available, but instead the path that they may follow. This then starts to expand even further when you factor in things like double jumping, which even if they do cut off other choices, still expands the tool set. This starts to make jumping, even with very rigid lines, entertaining and becomes part of player expression. While you may not have as many individual movement choices as something like KOF, their intertwined system makes for so many choices that you feel like a kid in a candy store, or a 23 year old in a, a Guilty Gear store. This store, this fucking analogy's falling apart. What you find is that as tools expand, people want to use them more for aggressive play, since it's more flashy and looking good helps them hide their broken ego, and so many games are built around the aggressive points that the new movement systems provide. You've got access to really fast overheads that become effective all the time in the corner, or overheads that can be accessed very fast from a mid-screen distance. Whilst jump-in overheads themselves haven't changed here, the time that they're usable has. In games with very simple jumping, the attack might come out with some different timing, but it's going to be very slight since there's only about a 10 to 15 frame window where the overhead can actually connect. With air dashing, you've got them available at almost all times, but you can also change the amount of potential time that you will have them for. Without an air dash, this type of timing just, it simply doesn't happen. It's not possible. It's a conspiracy theory. The schmix doesn't work without air dashing. This creates a whole new approach to both timing in the air as well as the effect of distance, as it shifts based on screen position and how much speed you were initially traveling at, how late or early you air dash, what kind of hitboxes come out at what speed and distance. And as I'm sure you can tell, this creates a dramatic shift in the game, not only for the person jumping in, but also the person having to respond to it. Now being on the opposite hemisphere as your opponent and being pressed right against your opponent can share an almost equal danger. I say almost equal because some characters can't respond very well from being full screen, and some characters have to be pressed against your opponent to do anything. It's also still going to be easier to respond to something that takes a longer amount of time to do, and so being at full screen generally still isn't a great time to jump in without a way to cover yourself, but still creates a variable danger zone. Now you can't rely on being safe from jump-ins from this longer distance because these positions can still spell out a full combo for you. This puts a huge amount of variables in play for any given situation, and assists the player in being able to find a lot of creativity in a system that previously was quite difficult to access. Because of this and the general idea that people are going to be coming at you from this more horizontally focused angle, you tend to find that good anti-airs in these kinds of game cover more in front of you rather than directly above you. These changes to movement and the many systems that change to accommodate the new systems takes emphasis away from trying to cover this portion of the screen with fireballs and then playing a footsie jumping game here, and instead creates a game that changes based on your character's tools and goals and where they press advantage most effectively. Take a character like Accent Core Venom that would break a more grounded game with less movement options, but since he's in an environment where characters are created with this more extreme movement potential in mind, he's fine, but he still has to play into his goal of setting up balls and knockdown and also being the most fun character in the game. Many games that have this more freeform movement will have characters that individually want to achieve different types of win conditions. Why this is the case, I wouldn't really be able to tell you, but because the characters generally are designed to be wildly different between each other, it's pretty common to see the perspective that learning new characters in these games is much harder than the other ones. Exiled's characters generally follow the flow of do X to set up Y, or the game ends if X. Ironically, you could debate that this style of design creates less freedom in its characters and systems, but I'd argue that it helps to give characters more defined strengths and weaknesses instead of cutting off particular types of play. Games that have less movement tend towards goals like I want to control this portion of the screen, because the game doesn't have enough choices that allows the opponent to effectively make decisions based on my positioning. The characters in turn don't have things that they want to achieve in particular, but their own particular spaces that they want to control. Which isn't a bad thing, I don't want to see anyone in the comments going, ah oh, you see this is why Street Fighter V is b -b 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 fuck off, they're just different games. The point that I'm admittedly failing to get at is that as changes start to be made in the airspace, many game developers chose to take the opportunity and change the game in ways that made good and bad choices different from other games. When you give the player different choices, you're inevitably going to give the player different feelings. Street Fighter can feel quite restrictive at times, because you have to solve many different problems with the same tools, occasionally using the tools in unique and novel ways that aren't immediately obvious. In games with more choices, you're going to feel a greater sense of player freedom, because there's more situations that you can create, but in turn that means that good players can craft a fucking Da Vinci code for you to solve. To attempt to return some of that player freedom, a lot of games opted to have defensive choices 
choices be available more consistently. The previously mentioned air blocking is in many games, but often doesn't allow you to block a move that's grounded unless you spend some kind of resource to do so. However, to make it balanced in favour of the person attacking, many games chose to make it so that the person blocking has the momentum stuffed and doesn't advance from the jump once they've blocked. This means that anyone who's blocking in the air trying to avoid projectiles typically still have a hard time finding their way in, making it so that playing effective zoning isn't impossible, it's just restricted and difficult. To assist overcoming the fiasco that is air defense and ensure that you've still got plenty of ways to deal with the same problem, many games introduced air throwing, but whether or not it's an effective way to deal with someone that's blocking tends to vary from character to character. But even with all of these changes, some players might find it frustrating to deal with a system that gives someone jumping so much freedom, and so they started to change even more. Generally speaking, hitboxes changed to be more in favor of the person pressing and got larger to make it easier to swap people out of the sky when they've got more places that they can be in the air. Without larger hitboxes, you'd feel like you're trying to go fishing with a needle instead of a spear, or like a net. I don't really know how fishing works. They also introduced more moves that encourage you to meet your opponent in the air. Whilst this does exist in other games like Ryu's jumping medium punch, you're still only able to get one move out before you hit the ground. Instead of making specific moves that were really good in the air, many games introduced fast taking moves that you could press multiple times in the air to start combos with. Many characters in Guilty Gear have jump P's that are designed to be moves to intercept your opponent midway through their travel, and also start combos but be safe if they're blocked. A side effect of this is more tick throw situations, which I have very, very fond memories of. Oh god, insane. Ah. Oh. Because of these expanded choices and greater emphasis on game feel and freedom, games that involve more complex movement systems generally tend towards the perception of being faster games. Because hitboxes changed to be more generous and options became more plentiful, you find that there's many ways that a good player can end someone that's less skilled than them much faster. And whilst maybe not all of these changes were made because of a more accessible air game, to me it seems like the expansion of the vertical space certainly played a part in these changes. And sometimes that greater expansion of airspace isn't a universal agreement, which makes characters have their own unique identity. Characters with flight like Doctor Doom allow them to control a portion of the screen and be very dynamic in the position that he's effective, not only by allowing him the opportunity to reposition wherever he'd like, but also to hold vertical space with a unique timing by being in the same spot for so long. Guilty Gear is full of characters that don't necessarily give them more expanded vertical space, but allow them to change the timing on that vertical space a lot. Whilst you've got characters like Heihun and Sol that do have moves that change their jump arcs to make it look like your art teacher fell over, characters like Venom and Testament have moves that freeze their momentum. In the case of Venom, you can set a ball and this freeze occurs, but your momentum is retained once the ball set finishes. This allows you to create a very strange timing that allows you to capitalize on players that are playing very responsive with anti-airs. And whilst it does leave you very vulnerable to air-to-airs, it provides new and unique choices to make. Whilst it might not affect the jump arc directly, the different timing creates new ways to bait out your opponent. My favorite being this little mix-up. God, I fucking love hitting that. However, as previously mentioned, there's moves that are unique to characters that provide them with extra mobility. Some of you might be thinking of moves like Ken's EX Air Tatsu in Third Strike, which allows you to take a jump arc that traditionally looks like this or this and make it look like this. Yeah. But then you've got characters like Chun Hua, I can't fucking say that name, who takes all the mobility concepts from many different games and crams it all into one character and makes the most enjoyable character in the game. If you disagree with me, fight me in real life. I'm not very good at this game. Look at that fucking upward dive kick. It's so sick. But whilst all of this is great, you don't necessarily have to expand movement to give characters unique identities. In a game with a lot of aerial options, you can also be reductive to someone's move set to provide them with their own unique playstyle, and also to balance them. I would love to talk about Tega, but I don't play CF, so uh, more Guilty Gear, am I right boys? <laughs> In a game where everyone has air dashing, Potemkin can't, uh, Justice can't either, but you know, just ignore that. This helps to give Potemkin a very defined role, it's a slow tank that hits hard as fuck, and so your goal is to play as much keep out as possible and make it so that he's never able to get into his very strong positions. If he was moving around like everyone else, you'd still have a fun character, but you'd have a less clearly defined character, and personally speaking, you'd make a less interesting character to play against. The key thing that I'd like to pull away from Potemkin, Justice, Tega, all of these characters that have more restrictive movement is that just because something is gone doesn't mean that it's bad, and adding these complexities doesn't necessarily mean that it's good, it's just different. So what does a bad jump look like? The original Street Fighter, aka the alcohol baby of fighting games, has this bizarre jump that's just awful to play with. What makes it so sickening is that whilst it does, as I'm sure you've seen, go up and down, it doesn't follow an arc. Whilst other games have this incline, a gradual slowdown, and then a slow increase in momentum towards the ground, Street Fighter 1 instead has a fixed incline to a set period where you're in the air and a fixed incline down. This makes it a hard mechanic to approach, both as the person that's jumping in and the person that's responding to it. Putting aside the awful DP motion of Street Fighter 1, it's hard to anti-air something that has such a snappy startup since you have no build-up or anticipation. Due to the very immediate transitions between each of these states, it's hard to create a mental map of where someone's 
one's about to be without having seen the timing for this jump many, many times since it goes against our natural understanding of how gravity impacts anything. However, in subsequent Street Fighters, you'll notice that the jump rises, has a longer hanging period because it takes a while for gravity to impact objects, and then falls with increasing velocity because gravity exists. This hanging period and gradual fall helps to build anticipation and inform our actions. Without it, it's not only frustrating for the person that's getting jumped in on, but also infuriating for the person using the jump as they snap from state to state, making it hard to correctly time a jump in or use any of the tools effectively. And then there's the neutral jump, which I, I, I literally can't figure out what the goal was. Fuck it, it exists in a game where walking is actually a collection of hops, who gives a fuck? As you can very clearly see, the issue isn't that the jump isn't complex, it's that the jump is implemented poorly. Like Takashi Nishiyama was trying to save a thirsty man from dehydration by giving him seawater. This is a simple jump, but it's frustrating to use because it makes a solution to problems barriers to sanity by being the only choice available and feels awful without adding anything to the game. Whilst I'd certainly say that I prefer a more complex air game, there's a reason why the more simple yet restricted use of airspace still sticks around today. Some people just want to play a ground-focused fighting game, and some people want to be so far away from their opponent they're willing to push advancements in space travel to do it. Thankfully, fighting games are a vast and diverse genre, so I think we're going to see many unique approaches to airspace stick around. And even if we did wake up one day and all of a sudden Tekken was an air dasher, we'd still have a long history of fighting games that allow us to see a wide array of the use of air. So in conclusion, I don't know man, I just think that jumping in fighting games is surprisingly cool. Jump arcs might not be the end all be all to the contribution of the way that a fighting game is made and played, but it's certainly a large part of it. Yeah, you've got games like Power Rangers that have floaty and simple jumps, but you'd be hard pressed to find anyone with a shred of sanity that says it plays like Street Fighter. Skullgirls might have air dashes, but it's not the same as Guilty Gear. But by changing the way that jumps work, you've created new tools and can create entirely new scenarios for the player, which helps to add to the loving complexity and individuality of fighting games, which as a genre, fighting games are amazing for. For a genre that's often mislabeled as one where every game plays the same, it's stunning to me just how much developers and players have taken such a simple concept and expanded it. Whether you want to jump in, fuck all, air dash out, air dash in to immediate death, or never return to the ground, there's a place for you. And I know where mine is, it's right here, in Guilty Gear XR Rev 2. See you around, whether it's in the next video, next game, or next year, have a good one. Whilst I've got you at the end of the video, I'd just like to say thank you very much for watching and supporting this year. The growth has been pretty fucking good. I'd also like to thank Logan at the Twitter account play underscore more underscore KOF. She helped me to find quite a lot of the guiding resources for KOF and uh, even though I don't particularly enjoy the game, uh, I appreciate it nonetheless. But uh, yeah, I'll see you in 2021 and uh, thanks for thanks for watching. Uh, have a uh, play some Guilt Year.